thank you for your love and your mercy, your truth, your grace. Father, thank you so much for everything you have done for us and continue to do for us. Father, I pray that you would move in our midst this morning. Father, open, um, open the eyes of our understanding. Unlock our hearts and our minds that we may learn and grow. Father, we love you. We praise you. We worship you. Father, I pray that you would continue to walk before us, beside us. Father, protect us, lead us, and guide us. Father, we love you and praise you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, guys, um, for the last few months, we've been talking about uh, why our Bible, basically. Uh, how did we get the Bible? Where did it, you know, how did it begin? Things like that, right? Let's see who's paying attention. Anna, how did the Bible begin? In the beginning. <laughs> how does the Bible begin? When did writing begin? <laughs> Come on, guys. We don't have to guess. We've went over this pretty good, pretty thoroughly. When did writing begin? Was a good indication from scriptures. When did writing begin? With Cain. How? There you guys go. Now the wheels are turning. It's a little early. Get your cup of coffee. Get on board. Okay. So we know, uh, kind of, we have a glimmering of when writing began. It began with, with, with God marking Cain. Uh, writing is, in, this, in its essence, describe what writing would be. You would say, well, it's uh, to, you know, write, to write. Well, no, it's, it's actually expressing through a symbol, a mark, an idea. Okay. To be able to communicate non-verbally an idea or a thought, whether it be instructions or notes to be played on a keyboard or a guitar, it's to convey non-verbally an expression or a thought or an idea. Well, that was seen first with Cain, right? So we've looked at some things. We uh, who. We've a asked and answered some questions like, who wrote the Torah? Yeah, I threw you for a curveball. The first five books of the Bible? Moses. Moses. How do we know? Well, because Exodus is filled with all of his writings, and Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But how about Genesis? Jewish history and Hebrewic history points toward Moses as the author, but he wasn't there. Not just oral traditions. Oral traditions would have been part of it, very possibly. There you go. He's the one that organized it. Now, how did he do that? Well, we know that writing existed in, in Abraham's day. How do we know that? Documents existed. Writing existed. How? A title deed. Specifically, a title deed. He was given a deed to the land. Okay? We also see other things. We see... Um, God testifying to, I believe it is Isaac or Jacob, one of the two, uh, the son or the grandson of Abraham. God said, he has followed my decrees, my commands, my laws, my statutes. And he gives a list of things. It's like four, five, six different things. So how, how are those if it's just oral? Well, it's not just oral. It was something that was in written form. Okay? The traditions, the... Um, Everything that was passed down in Genesis, this is very important, guys. Everything that's passed down in Genesis came across, let's say, Moses' desk. And there was a lot of things that came across his desk that were not inspired. How did, how did Moses know what oral traditions or even what written passages were the way of God? Well, two reasons. Okay? One. Because God himself overshadowed it. So he preserved it. Are we clear? Not just caused it. Because God can cause, you can cause something and not take credit for it. Or not be recognized for it. God ensured, because nobody was there on day one. Let there be light. Adam wasn't in the bleachers. Hello? So how do we know it was in that order? How do we know, how do we know, uh, and it's called the creation hymn, how do we know 
One, that it was in that order, and two, that it was God that did it. But we have Jesus, a couple millennia later, saying, God the creator from the beginning, so he's acknowledging the Father God as the creator. Gotcha. But what about during Moses' time? How did Moses know Yahweh that was the creator, not this whole plethora and panoram of all these different deities and gods? How come that stick right there wasn't the creator? Or that little idol? Or this little idea of Zeus in the clouds from Mount Olympus? Come on, guys. How, do we, how, did, how, did, he, how did he know? Well, he, first of all, he had an encounter, but then God revealed it to him. How? Through oral traditions. Through his, his birthright, he was a Hebrew. And he knew that from very young, not like the movies portray. Oh, whoops, I'm what? I'm adopted? Ah, nobody tells me a thing. No. So he knew from young. How do we know? Well, his mama took care of him. The scriptures show us that he knew. And he, when he was old enough, he went out and hung out with his brethren, the Hebrews, the slaves. As a prince of Egypt, he's coming out, and he's not liking what he's seeing. So we have, we have from the time of Adam to the time of Noah, the record of events in genealogies and so forth. But you also have the story. And then from Noah to the time of Babel, from the time of Babel, the world is dispersed, but God chooses a man, Abraham, Abram, and there he sets up shop. It sets up camp. He says, I'm going to be with you forever, your generations after you. I'm going to walk with you. Okay? And I'm going to bless the world through you. So this would be kind of an earmark moment where he would be like, I am going to journal this stuff. Because, and, and grandpa, great grandpa, you know, whatever, and back further and so on and so forth, all the way back through history, Grandpa Noah, great grandpa Noah, and, and, and even before that, you have Enoch, and Enoch knew both Noah and, or excuse me, Methuselah, and Methuselah knew both Noah and Adam. So all the way back, you have family tradition handed down, handed down. And it's not just oral tradition. We know that writing existed. So here we have the beginning of the Bible. So when somebody says, um, you don't, your Bible's incomplete. That's kind of a harsh thing to say. And when Christians are buying into that, we have a problem. Uh, do you have that video clip? Can you do that? All right, guys, uh, before she plays that, um, this is kind of what like ticked me off and got me kick, you know, going on this because I am very well aware of like the apocryphal writings and they're called, um, starts with an S, <sighs> sporadic, not sporadic, it's like along those lines, um, spurious, spurious writings um, that are like the, the apocryphal writings, like um, Book of Jubilees, I want to say Enoch is in that. Uh, Maccabees are in that. Maccabees 1 and 2. I was looking up, you know, Maccabees, and there's like, Maccabees 1, 2, 3, and 4. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm aware of 1 and 2. What is this, 3 and 4? There's more and more popping up. What's going on? You have um, Susanna. You have the a bell and the dragon, the uh, Song of the Three Holy Children, things like that. I have right here with me today a copy of the Catholic Bible. And for the fun of it, I uh, counted up how many New Testament books they have. This is interesting. In the New Testament, they have 27 books. How many do we have in ours? 27. Same 27. New Testament. Old Testament is how much? 39. Together, they make 66 in the Catholic Bible, right here, they have 46 books. We have 39. They have 46. What up? What up? Like, for instance, um, Tobit, Judith, Maccabees 1, Maccabees 2. Uh, we have Ecclesiastes. Okay. Then we have uh, Ecclesiasticus. Huh. Interesting. Um, Baruch. And then inside of Daniel, there's three hidden books. 
So those didn't even make it to the count because they just included it as Daniel. In Daniel, in our Bible, it ends with chapter 12. In Daniel, in their Bible, it ends with chapter 14. In Daniel chapter 3, in our Bible, it ends at verse 30. Daniel chapter 3, in their Bible, ends at verse 100. Okay, did we get shorted? What the heck? No, that's not the case. We need to find out how to answer that question. Do you know what I'm talking about? You need to find out when people say, hey, you guys, you bunch of Christians, man, I love you guys, and you're my brothers and sisters, but, man, you just don't have the complete story. You have been shorted. <sighs> You've been deceived. And people, thank God, not in this church, I would be having very serious one-on-one -on -one conversations, and then I'd be having very public, hey, not that person, but I'd say, hey, this doctrine, we're not going for this. We don't believe in this, and here's why. Well, I'm trying to do that here and now. Sure, sure. Well, we'll look at that uh, in time to come. But for now, let's, let's bite off this whole big thing. Now, again, I said... The reason that we started this out is because people were peddling this new Bible. And I was wondering, I was starting to wonder, like, what is this new Bible? So I took the time to find out. You want to see what this new Bible is? It's called a Sefer. Makes me sick. Makes me sick to my stomach. Here we go. Here's a preview. You ready? Kelly's got to, you got to unmute the, the thing. On the screen. Please. Do you ever feel like you're missing something when reading the Bible? As if there's a key piece of the puzzle that you haven't been able to find? Isn't there more to the story of creation? Why aren't there any books from the 400 years between the Old and New Testaments? And since the return of the Messiah is such a magnificent, triumphant, monumental event, why isn't there more information to help us prepare for His coming? It's as if the modern 66-book Bible is somehow incomplete. What if I told you that this Bible feels incomplete? Because it actually is. There's more published scripture that contemporary Western Bible editors have either removed or intentionally left out altogether. That's why we've compiled the Sefer a comprehensive restoration of sacred scripture that answers these questions and many more. Books like Enoch, Jubilees, and Jasher that expound upon the history of mankind and the real reason for Noah's flood. Like the Maccabees that fill in the historical blanks between Malachi and the Gospels. And like 2nd Baruch and 4th Ezra that further explain how the world will look as we draw nearer to the return of the Messiah. Each of these books and the rest of the 87 books included in the Sefer have been thoroughly researched and stood the test of time, providing missing pieces of the puzzle that generations have been seeking for thousands of years, painting an even more vivid picture of the Creator's love for us and publishing His true Hebraic name, Yahuwah. The Sefer Millennium Edition, answers for our generation. How do you feel? How does that make you feel? A little flip floppy, a little stomach upset kind of things. What's up? Don't add to, don't take away from. Great question. Apparently they haven't read it. It's not in theirs. Um... No, you've got to understand when these were introduced. These were introduced, some of them before Revelation, some of them after. So that being said, go ahead. Yeah. Another Testament is how they begin their book. Another Testament of Jesus Christ. Okay. And it's not found factually accurate. Matter of fact, it's quite the opposite, grossly quite the opposite. This has been disproven, the Book of Mormon, time and time again. There is no Hill Cumorah. The one that's attributed is Hill Cumorah uh, in, in New York City. 
or excuse me, New York State, the Hill Camorra, has not one shred of archaeological evidence that a, a, a people uh, called the Nephites lived there a thousand years previous and that millions of them died. Have you ever dropped a coin? Have you? Have you? Has anybody in here not dropped a coin? Now, most of us will stop, uh, stop and pick it, but if it's a penny or a dime or a nickel or something like that, we just tend to go on. It's them quarters we go for, right? <laughs> quarters are more useful. I mean, they're candy machines. There used to be telephones. There's washing machines, things like that. They don't take pennies and nickels and dimes. But all that to say is if a population the size of price, 20,000, 25,000 will be generous. How many suppose that there would be at least one coin to be found somewhere on the streets or in somebody's couch cushion? You suppose that there would be at least one? Well, when there's a million people, what do you suppose the odds of at least a few would be? Except when archaeology is overturning the Book of Mormon, there's not one shred of evidence. Not one. Well, that's kind of interesting. So this is going. To, this is leaning heavily on archaeology, not even to mention history. So big difference. Now, when you start looking at history, doesn't line up. The Book of Mormon doesn't have maps in it. You know why? Because there's no place on the planet Earth where the 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 map that they verbally draw out actually geographically works out. Interesting stuff. Well, they to cover their tracks said, "Oh, oops, it's not actually." In, in, you know, New York, <coughs> it's the Mayan Indians. That's what we're talking about. These are the descendants. Except the Mayan Indians, their bloodline, their DNA, actually shows of Oriental. Oriental background. So that's, this is a discussion for another time. We need to stop and consider these things and think about these things. Um, Mary would be closer to their DNA than a Mexican. <laughs> you know, or, or uh, you know, German, you know, et cetera. Sa Saudi Arabia, yeah, okay. Why aren't you a rich oil tycoon? <laughs> mm. Maybe she is. <laughs> when we watch this, guys, this is 87 books. Just, they're, they're, they're bragging 87 books to our 66. That's funny because here they have 74 in the Catholic Bible. So I'm like, who are they trying to outdo? Now check this out. Do a quick search on Amazon for the Sefer, and you'll find out that for $457.23, you can own the last copy available. $457. Now this is interesting, because I know somebody who doesn't have a lot of means who owns one of these Bibles and paid that much money, between four dollars and $500, for this. Now what do you suppose you're going to act like when you just suckered into a four or $500 book that's supposed to be, you're going to be hook, line, and sinker. How does a person get that stupid? We can't talk you into honoring the scriptures you know, paying your tithes, but yet you're willing to go out and spend $450 or $500 on a book that makes you an idiot. Now, why, is, why am I so strong about that? Why is, if you bought this book, you're a total idiot. Why would I say that? Because you don't understand how we got the scriptures. You don't understand what's true and then what's false. We need to learn how to discern and distinguish between what's true and false, what's right and wrong. Amen? You got your Bibles? First Timothy, go. <clears throat> or excuse me, First Thessalonians 5. Go. Verse, First Thessalonians chapter 5. What did you say, verse 9? What's it saying, verse 9? No. Let's go to, let's skip down to 19. There you go. Keep going. Next verse. Okay. Oh, hold up, hold up. We looked at this on uh, Wednesday night discipleship training, or uh, uh, the book study. It said, uh, it said this passage, do not quench the spirit, do not de despise prophecies. Right? Then the next verse, what does it say? Test all things. Test all things. 
Hold fast, what is good. Now question, are we to test everything? Are we supposed to buy into it at $450 because we'd look like a genius? In reality, we'd be idiots. No, we're supposed to test all things. So we're supposed to test this new claim of these new Bibles coming out that's saying you have been deceived as a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ. You don't get the full picture. Why? Because we have it. And for $450, you can have it too. No, thank you. No, thank you. That's $450. You're an idiot. At $20, you're still an idiot. No, I'd rather have the word of God. So the question is, the scriptures that we know tell us to test all things. My question is against what? Prize to you. Go get you a cup of coffee for free. <laughs> The spirit, not the spirit, but it's subject. Um, the Bible says that the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. In other words, you can bring them, um, you can prophesy out of your own heart, the Bible says. The problem with being led by the spirit, and I'm for it, don't misunderstand me, but the problem with that is what if you're led one way and I'm led a different? It becomes what's called subjective. It's subjective to you. If Chad gets up one day and feels like just slapping the snot out of me and I feel like walking in love and I feel led by the Spirit to walk in love and he feels led by the Spirit to tune me up. Well, hold up now. How is it different? How is it that the Holy Spirit's going to say, no, this is okay and this is not okay? You know how Jesus conquered Satan in the wilderness? It was by being led by the Spirit into the Scriptures. And then Satan, trying to pull one over on him, used the scriptures. He didn't misquote the scripture. People say, well, he misquoted the scripture. He didn't misquote them. He misapplied them. Okay? People do that often today. They say, well, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Careful. Careful. That's misapplying. You're quoting it, but you're misapplying it. Finish the thought. Finish the, the context. It's a matter of don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, don't be bragging and boasting and exposing your giving concerning charity because God is not about shaming. If you walked away and said, man, I just blessed Jay like no other. Like he didn't have bills. You know, he had too many bills and not enough money. And I, <laughs> you're right, the Lord led me to pay his bills for him. And I'm up here bragging like that. What's, who's getting glorified? Jimmy's getting glorified. Who's getting shamed? Jay, his family. And that's a problem. So that's what we don't do. So misapplying the scriptures, misincorporating them. He didn't, he didn't mis, misquote them. He quoted them. He misapplied them. That's the difference. Okay? So now all that to say, for us to understand why certain books of the Bible were not included and others were. Okay? To understand that, it would be helpful to understand how the ones that were accepted, how and why they were accepted. Then we'll understand better why the other ones were rejected. Okay? When I say the book of Maccabees, Why isn't that included in the Protestant Bible? But it is included in the Catholic Bible. There's a history behind it. But if you go back to the history, let's ask the people who included it. Why did you include this? And let's ask the people who did not include it. Why do you not include this? Okay? Let's ask these questions. Let's answer these questions. These questions to be answered, the technical term is canonicity or the canon. So you have some papers um, available. You can do some fill in the blanks. Um, again, we're to test all things. By what standard are we to test them? By the word of God, by the scriptures. For the scriptures that saith, you know, things like that. That's how we're to test them. But the question is, especially when a Bible with 87 books is coming out, against what scriptures? 
Um, Frank Turek, he does Christian apologetics. He, 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 he tried to answer this question, but the problem is it's just too big of an answer. To just grab, well, how come they included some of the Bible and then not of the Bible? And how come this and man, this is oh, a 10 minute answer doesn't do you justice. That scratches the surface. Here we are two, three months later, and I'm still trying to answer the same thing. I'm trying to tell you and show you how we got the Bible. I'm doing it in both story form. You know, Ezra, the scribe, after the 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 dispersion, after they were dispersed among the nations, um, he's coming back recollecting these lost books of the Bible. But what was so it was what was the problem here? Yeah, they were dispersed. They were lost for 70 years. They've been gone, but they weren't lost to the people who had them. The problem is they were never in doubt as to who they came from. That would be God through Moses to the people. Okay, so they're not in doubt as to their authority, but they're lost in the sense of they're dispersed. So he's recompiling them. So we've looked at it from a story perspective. Now let's look at it from a, a, a theological perspective, the canonicity. To answer that, um, to understand why we don't accept certain books in our Bible, it is helpful in understanding how and why we have come to accept the ones that we do. Why do we reject 87? Why do we reject 74? But yet we accept the 66. Why? That's a question you answer with canonicity. Now to understand that, I'm going to read. Uh, I have three books that I'm going to pull from today because they all say essentially the same thing. They just say it differently. And it's very important to me that we understand this. Okay, this one is a book that Davy loves. It took him a year to go through. Doctrine, What Christians Should Believe. Okay, great book. But Driscoll and... Okay, who cares? <laughs> it's Christian. It's, this is a legit book. It's a good one. I went through it. It took me a while, too, but not a year. It took me two months. I was listening to the Nadal Bible. Here we go. In page 51, I'm going to start. Um, it's called Revelation, God Speaks. Uh, you guys need a paper. It's a fill in the blank. That way you can answer the question, okay? Because he has three tests that are applied to the canonicity, okay? And this is the primary way that we determine for a New Testament church the New Testament writings, not the Old Testament, but the same test is pretty much applied to the Old Testament, all right, what is the canon of scriptures? The canon of scriptures is the collection of books that the church has received as having divine authority in matters of faith and doctrine. The term comes from the Greek word canon with a K, K-A-N-O-N, canon, and the Hebrew word kane with a Q, Q-A-N-E-H. Both words, Greek and Hebrew, both of which means a rule or a measuring rod. The canon is an authority to which other truth claims are compared and by which they are measured. Hence, we just read in the scriptures, test all things. Test them against what? Against the word of God. Well, this one claims to be the word of God. So then test it. Test it. Against what? The standard, the rule, the measuring rod, the canon. Does that make sense? The canon is an authority to which... Other truth claims are compared and by which they are measured. To speak of canonical writings is to speak of those books that are regarded as having divine authority. They are the books of the Bible. Plural, books. Okay? The 39 books of the Old Testament and 27 books of the New Testament, graciously preserved by God in the Bible, are the inspired 
word of God. The church recognized that these books constitute the complete canon, the complete canon inspired by God. Again, as Evan pointed out, Revelation says don't add to, don't take away from. Well, here we have a new edition. I find it funny. 2,000 years after Christ, this Bible is now popping up. Don't you find that a little unsettling? Yeah, well, for $450, you could get the last one. All right, the complete canon inspired by God and received them as uniquely authoritative because they are God speaking to his people. And there's a quote from F.F. F. Bruce right there. I'm not going to take time to read that. I'm going to skip to page 53. I want to make sure that I'm not... Now, uh, time after time, Jesus and his apostles quoted from the distinctive body of authoritative writings. They, des they designated them as the scriptures or the scripture, the holy scripture, the sacred writings and so forth. And they often included their quotations with it is written. That is, it stands firmly written. OK, we call these authoritative writings the Old Testament. Jewish people call them the Tanakh, an acronym formed from the first letters of the Torah, the law, the Nevi'im, the prophets, and the Ketabim, the writings. We see this idea when Jesus explained to his disciples, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Luke chapter 24, verse 44. <clears throat> It is important to note that the Tanakh includes the same materials as the Protestant, heavy on the Protestant, Old Testament. In other words, this is not the same as the Catholic Bible. This is the Protestant Bible. What's the difference? 46 to 39. Okay? Um... So it's the same, the Tanakh is the same Old Testament as the Protestant Old Testament. However, they are arranging the books differently. Beginning 250 years before Christ, Greek-speaking Jews lived in Alexandria. They translated the Old Testament into Greek, calling it the Septuagint. So 250 years before Christ, living in Alexandria, Egypt, people updating from Hebrew to the now current language, which was Greek, founded by Alexander the Great. Okay, Alexander the Great conquered the known world. And when he did that, what did he bring with him? Their culture. And their language. And how did he cause the language to spread? By taking all these people with Greek culture and language from Greece and put them everywhere in the known world. And he birthed a city called Alexandria. <laughs> Alexander the Great gave birth to Alexandria. And, and, and Egypt developed it, caused the libraries and etc. and etc. And here we have a couple hundred years later, these Jews by invitation, coming to Alexandria, living there, and they decide, you know what? We need an updated version. We need to get from Hebrew because nobody's speaking Hebrew anymore. Everybody's tending to go the way of the world. They're speaking English. Greek. Like we, and we don't speak Hebrew here. We speak English, Spanish, Spanglish, whatever we speak here. Yeah. Nyanja. Nyanja is an is a African language. Not a lot of people know. Nobody really cares. <laughs> Swahili. You know, uh, some fun languages. Well, at any rate, they're, uh, they're updating their Bibles. And so there's this named, the Bible that they produced is called the Septuagint. This is 250 years before Christ. This is very, very important because at 250 years before Christ, these guys produce a, from Hebrew to Greek, a Bible. But they also included books like Maccabees 1 and 2 and Esdras and Tobit and 
uh, Susanna, the song of Susanna and the song of the three holy children and Bell and the dragon. And they, they included all these. And this is where it starts to go wrong. 250 years before Christ. So listen to what this says. Beginning 250 years before Christ, Greek-speaking Jews living in Alexandria translated the Old Testament into Greek, calling it the Septuagint. For some unknown reason, they changed the content of several books. And they added many books, and they rearranged the order of the books. Now, to me, it's not criminal to rearrange the order of the books. Ezra is the one that arranged them. Tradition, Jewish tradition says that Ezra is the one that arranged them. But they decided to rearrange them. Why? Don't, I don't know. Maybe to make it more chronological? I, I don't know. Because that's how, you know, they fell across his desk? I don't know. That's not criminal. But to add? To, to add to it? That's a problem. You've crossed the line. <laughs> sure. Book of Acts does that. It jumps chronologically. It jumps, but it jumps decades, and we don't see that. We don't know that. We just read it, read it as like, wow, that was Tuesday. Yeah, that's Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Um, early Christians, okay, they rearranged the order of the books. They added many books, and they adjusted the content of several books. They changed the content of several books. Um, early Christians followed Jesus and used the same books as found in the Hebrew Bible today. Now, here's the thing. In other words, what I'm telling you is... There's a version that was existing 250 years before Christ. There was a version being passed around that people were trying to say, hey, this is the good stuff. You know, this is the full Bible. And the Hebrew scholars said, no, there's, bio, there's books in there that we don't accept as from God. They might be good, they might be historical, but we don't accept them as from God. They're good. They deserve their own place on the shelf, but it's a place underneath the Bible, not in the Bible. Are we clear? So when Jesus is on the scene, this Bible's in existence. And he quotes from the Greek versions of the Bible. In other words, he's quoting from the Septuagint. But nowhere does he quote, not one single time, neither do the apostles or the early church accept or quote or endorse the apocryphal writings that were in that version, okay? So this is, to, to better understand this, what I'm saying is there's a version out there that they knew that there was around them, and there was parts in that that they just rejected as a whole. How do we know? They never endorsed it. They never quoted it, not once. They didn't embrace this, not once. So if that's the case, and the early church, the apostles themselves, and the Lord Jesus Christ, then why are we? Why are we seeing these new Bibles popping up to suffer? It's saying, we have 87 books, not 66. You guys are deceived. Really? We are? Jesus never embraced that. Why are you? Well, because it talks about Jesus. It fills in the gaps. We have a problem, and you don't know how to answer it. Well, here's a big answer. Jesus didn't accept it. The early church didn't accept it. The, the, the apostles and the prophets, they did not accept it. So why, were you, why are you trying to get me to accept it? If he didn't accept it, I'm pretty sure he wasn't deceived. I could be subject to deception. But Jesus, come on. The people who walked with Jesus, come on. Come on. No. So the question is, how do the, uh, we're out of time, but the three tests that are applied that Christians, uh, for, for the scriptures, is conformity. Uh, and we'll unpack this later. Apostasy, or uh, apostolicity. 
excuse me, not apostasy, apostolicity uh, and catholicity. Those are the three. We'll, we'll cover these more uh, in the time to come. But conformity, does it agree with the rest of the scriptures? Uh, apostolicity, is this written by an apostle or an eyewitness? Is this written by somebody who was actually there or is this 100 years later? The gospel according to Thomas was written almost 200 years later, I believe. 1945 is when they found it. But when was it written? It's dated back two centuries after Christ. Come on. This is ridiculous. So can they confirm that that was written by Thomas? No, they cannot. And when they look at it, it doesn't conform to the rest of the scriptures. And the third test, the Catholicity. In other words, how was it received by the people? Oh, it's some hidden book just popping out of nowhere. And a few select few who are not deceived, who pay the $450, <laughs> they get this inside track. So it's just for us special click club Christians. In reality, it's not received by the general whole and it's not recognized by the general whole and it doesn't transform people by the general whole. So it fails the third test as well. First test, conformity. Second test, is it genuine? Genuinely written by one of Jesus' followers or an eyewitness? And then three, the third test, is, uh, is it accepted? Josh McDowell, in his book, The Evidence That Demands a, De Demands a New Verdict, on pages 20 through 25, uh, there's five tests. Was it written by a prophet or a spokesman for God? Number two, was it written, was the writer confirmed by acts of God? Number three, did the message tell the truth about God? Incidentally, a lot of these 87 books, um, the ones beyond the 66, they're telling them some wacky stories about God. One of them tells, and I remember reading this, one of them says, God said, go ahead and lie. God says, go ahead and lie. Yeah, yeah that's the same effect that it has on theologians and scripture readers who actually know God. And so these other people say, no, 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 see, God right here says it's okay to lie. Oh, oh, that makes me sick to my stomach. I want to smack somebody really bad. Spirit said to. That's subjective. We'll do that, right? All right, so then, hold on. Number four. Okay, number three is, does the message tell the truth about God? Number four, does it come with the power of God? That one is, does it actually change you? Mold you and make you better. Number five was, was it accepted by the people of God? These are the tests of how they included which book into the canon. The list. These are the tests. If they failed any one of these tests, it was set aside. Some of them were thrown out completely because they were false and in error. You guys remember seeing the movie The Da Vinci Code? Yeah. Tom Hanks. Daniel Brown, the writer of The Da Vinci Code, makes a claim in there. There were over 70 different Gospels considered for which ones would be included in the, in the scriptures. He lied. That's a blatant lie. Nowhere in church history and in church councils was there ever 70 gospels presented for consideration. From the very beginning, it has always been four. There was one, and then there was two, then there was three, and then four. Never 70. He lied. But yet we have a culture that's now gravitating toward this lie saying, yeah, let's go ahead and buy this 70 or, or $450 Bible, the Sefer, that tells us that you were deceived and, and Jesus did have kids. He had sex with Mary Magdalene. And he got married and he had kids and he rode off into the sunset. Oh, and he healed birds when he was a kid. And there was a kid that died because he got T.O.'d at him. And, and he died, and so Jesus felt kind of bad. Even though he was a bully, he went and raised him from the dead, and he was not even 12 years old when he did this. He was just a kid, like seven. And he did this, and you guys don't get the whole story, except that blatantly contradicts the known and, and revealed word of God. So it doesn't line up with the rest of the word. It's not conforming to what God has revealed about himself. It is not conforming. The Bible says in John, 
this beginning of miracles. What was the first miracle Jesus did? Water. Water into wine. How do you know beyond any shadow of doubt that that was the first miracle? Because it says so. This beginning of miracles. It says so. So this crap about Jesus doing little bird miracles and practicing his deity is crap. It's B.S. Can I say that in church? It is. It's straight up false doctrine. And they even made a movie about it. It's called The Young Messiah. Has anybody seen that? I watched it. I knew full and well. This is going to be junk. But I'm curious as to what they say and how they portray it. And that's the nonsense you see. Where were that movie? What is the script? What gave that movie the idea to be made is some of these false gospels. The gospel according to Mary. The gospel according to Thomas. No, them's Bible names. So it must be true. Except just, it was, an, it was a, uh, not an endorsement. What's, what's the word? A plagiarism, where you're assuming the identity of somebody else in writing. I'm going to write to Congress in the name of Jim Darter. <laughs> you get yourself into trouble. The sheriff comes knock on his door. I hacked into his account and said, death to the sheriff or something stupid, right? And they come knock on his door, and he could be charged. And he's, wait a minute, wait a minute, that had nothing to do with me. My password got out there. I don't know what to say. I'm real sorry. That's not who I am. That's not what I want to be. Look at his track record. Turns out it's not in that direction at all. He actually likes the sheriff. He just said so. So this plagiarism idea is, um, that happened, guys. And now it's being presented to the church, this $450 Bible, one copy left. It could be yours. You poor Christians, been deceived. We have 87 books. You only have 66. Get the whole story. Paul Harvey endorsed. Now you know the rest of the story. Yeah, horse crap. All right. I'm fired up about this, guys. This is, this is something that we need to com combat. Yeah, there was an amen that goes right there. There's something, this is something we need to combat. Are you guys okay with this? Can I do my job? Can you let me be your pastor and say, stay away from this crap? Educate yourself. Become a disciple. Follow me, Jesus said, and I'll make you. Okay, okay, let's do that. Amen.